It's my pleasure now to welcome to the podium Narissa Drager, who's been a wonderful partner for us from LAM Research, and she will say a few words and introduce our fireside chat speakers. Good morning. Welcome to everybody who uh, braved group gatherings to be here today and those of you online. Um, I'm representing LAM Research, which is one of the symposium sponsors. And not all of you may be familiar with us, uh, but one of the things we like to say is that it starts with LAM. So almost all of the leading edge devices that are in today's electronic products have been made using LAM equipment. It's this equipment and technology which is used to fabricate the integrated circuits that power the capabilities that we are here to talk about today. And LAM's vision is that by bringing unique individuals and viewpoints together, we can achieve extraordinary results. And we need those diverse people and perspectives to be able to come up with new innovations and deliver the best products. And to achieve that, we need a diverse STEM pipeline. And I want to just take a moment to read a, a statement that the United Nations Women's Organization recently shared that I want to share with all of you. And it is that if you're reading this tweet, you're holding a device that was made in a sector dominated by men. Less than 30% of scientific and technological researchers are women. And the UN goes on to share these statistics about our future. 65% of primary school children today will end up in jobs that don't exist yet. And when there are new STEM opportunities, women gain only, women gain only one while men gain five. And I truly believe, like organizations of the Women in Tech Initiative at UC and the rest of the leaders and the sponsors that are participating in the Cybersecurity Symposium are working to change those statistics and to ensure that the global electronics industry and all of the industries that it has created, like cybersecurity, continue to flourish. Uh, so this symposium is really an area of extreme importance to all of us, and it requires significant innovations. So I'm honored to be able to introduce the speakers at the fireside chat. Window Snyder is a security industry veteran and chief security officer at Square. She has previously held security leadership roles at Apple, Microsoft, Mozilla, Fastly, and Intel. She is a pioneer in the field of application security, the inventor of the methodology known as threat modeling, and co-author of Threat Modeling, a manual for security architecture analysis and software. And I'm sure that you all know Sujay King Liu, <laughs> Dean of the College of Engineering, and Roy W. Carlson, Professor of Engineering at UC Berkeley. She's been a faculty member in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science since 1996 and is currently the TSMC Distinguished Professorship in Microelectronics. She is also a co-founder of the Women in Tech Initiative at UC, along with Camille, and one of the reasons that we are all here in the room today. So please welcome them to the stage. All right, good morning everyone and welcome to the um, Women in Tech Symposium. It's my pleasure to have this opportunity to have a, a conversation with Window Snyder, a, a leader, um, a role model for many of us here, um, who's a pioneer in, in the field of cybersecurity. So I thought maybe to start, Window, could you give us uh, some highlights uh, on your own personal career journey and how you ended up in cybersecurity? Absolutely. This, uh, this whole morning, I've actually been thinking about my mother. Um, my mother came over from Kenya as a, uh, a, a student, um, and uh, she wanted to study mathematics, but she was discouraged from, from, from going down that path. This is the mid-60s. And um, so she studied education, she became a teacher, and moved to California, where there was a teacher surplus. So she applied that master's degree to waitressing for a little while, <laughs> until she uh, uh, identified an opportunity to be a software tester. So she became a software engineer, um, 
back then there was a path from testing through software engineering. They were considered separate um, uh, practices with their own, with their own uh, unique uh, career paths. But, um, so she was a software engineer. And so in my teenage rebellion, even though she kept insisting that I should really get into computers, I, you know, I had learned to program early. I had my mother as a, as a, as a, not just a role model, but she, you know, there was a TI-99 in my house and uh, TI Basic, which I was actually really excited about when I was, uh, when it first showed up in our house. And I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it beyond that point. Um, but I was gonna be a writer, mom. I, you know, yeah, computers are great, but over here, I'm, I'm over here in the humanities. And uh, at some point, I, I realized actually my passion was in mathematics and computer science. And uh, I fell in with a group of, uh, let's say, computer security hobbyists in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Voluntary sysadmins. <laughs> um, and you know, I realized this is actually something that I feel very passionate about. I'm really excited about things like taking systems apart, finding out how they work. The first time I discovered a multi-user op multi operating system in the you know, early 90s, I was just fascinated. What's keeping my data separate from everyone else's? What's keeping my process separate from the kernel? And back then the answer was, not much. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was fascinating to me, and it's this, this, this space where there, at the time, there wasn't, there wasn't a set of books. I couldn't go you know, join a program and take a class in any of this stuff. So we built our own tools. We came up with our own systems for figuring this stuff out, for identifying vulnerability, for building resilience. And um, it uh, eventually turned into an industry because other people found value in this work, which is fantastic for me uh, and for you folks. Um, but there was a, a really long period of time where anything that you found that provided some sort of value, that was effective, was you had an opportunity to make that a standard, make that uh, useful to other folks. And so it's, it's easy to be a pioneer when there's nothing in place. <laughs> um, there were no books, there were no classes, there was, you know, there were a, a bunch of folks who might share information with each other, but um, maybe not. It was also kind of a, a, a space where there weren't a whole lot of women, um, and it was not a friendly place. Um, so a lot of folks who had something significant to contribute didn't stick around because it wasn't a place you wanted to spend time, uh, a community that you wanted to spend time with. Um, but for the folks, folks who did manage to stick around, it was because they loved it, because they had a passion for it, because they were good at it. Um, and uh, I'm so lucky that some of these women are still friends of mine today, that they are successful uh, in the security space. And um, growing up together with the industry, we had a chance to to make contributions that uh, are, are still being used today, that are still in place today. And we get to do what we love, and I'm so thrilled to be a part of this community. Early on, uh, one of the, the things that I was doing was uh, identifying how I think about these things and trying to uh, describe it so that I could help other people do the same thing when I was uh, considering how an application would be vulnerable, how I would compromise this system, how I'd compromise this network, how I'd compromise this application. And uh, this, this uh, there was a VC called Battery. They decided they wanted a security consulting company. They uh, uh, hired me to work on the PKI practice, which it turns out nobody wanted. Nobody wants a PKI, and that's for good reason. It's, it's, it's expensive, and uh, this is the sort of exactly the sort of thing that you should outsource to somebody else. Uh, but every time I went to a client, they would say things like, how do I know my system is secure. How do I know um, my, 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 applic my application is, is going to be secure? And um, I, I had good answers for this. I was like, oh, actually, I can tell you exactly how I would go about breaking this. And um, putting this, uh, the, the, the sorts of things that I was thinking about, how I would approach this into uh, repeatable methodology was the basis for what's now called threat modeling. Um, identifying at what points we should uh, do what sort of security work uh, was at the time a set of services that I developed for a company called AtStake. And uh, when I went to Microsoft, it was the foundation for what became the security development lifecycle. Um, Microsoft was feeling a lot of pain around malware and um, uh, worms at the time. And uh, that was also very convenient for me because it gave me a lot of um, opportunity to suggest things that would make a difference and uh, build upon success 
because yeah, pain is a great motivator. So um, getting, it, getting to the place where we could say, not only should we do this work, we should make it public so folks can develop confidence that we're doing something reasonable. They can take this work that we're doing and apply it to their own environments and protect the ecosystem broadly because after you secure you know, to the best of your ability this system, they're going to go look for the next opportunity and uh, everyone else in the ecosystem is gonna feel this, this kind of pain. So if we share this information, we can better equip folks to build more resilient software over time. And uh, that was, a, a real shift at the time. There was not a lot of interest in making this sort of uh, information public. Um, anything that at the time that you did in security was perceived as like, you know, we're unbreakable. And then, of course, painted a target on your back and um, made you potentially more vulnerable because folks would uh, spend time demonstrating that, in fact, you're not nearly as secure as you think. You're never secure. Someone can always demonstrate an opportunity. Um, so it was a, a big step to start talking about this stuff publicly and engaging other folks in the security community. It led to you know, incredible opportunities and getting a chance to work with uh, you know, Mozilla, I was the, uh, the CSO at Mozilla, uh, and uh, go on to places like Apple where I got to uh, make contributions in the privacy of, of OS X, and, well, security and privacy for iOS and OS X, um, at a point in time where it was hard for the industry to believe that anyone would care about privacy enough to tolerate the, um, the aspects of, of um, uh, those controls that interfered with just being able to do something. So every time your iOS device asks you, um, do you wanna give this app access to your location? Do you wanna give this app access to your, to your photos? That was a really hard justification to make when there wasn't a whole lot of data that consumers cared very much about their privacy and that for all these privacy violations we could see from you know, cloud services, from uh, network providers, that it didn't necessarily impact their business in a way that was tangible. So consumers were choosing it instead of uh, saying that this is not, and this is not acceptable, we're gonna, we're gonna move away from this platform because of, of, of our privacy concerns. So it's a, it's a difficult case to make. But I believed that consumers were not able to move away from these platforms because uh, maybe that social network has a monopoly on your friends. And if you move away from this platform, you're moving away from your community and the way your community decides to connect. Um, if you uh, move away from this provider, this uh, telecom provider, maybe you don't have broadband in your neighborhood otherwise. Maybe you don't have another viable option for your, 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 your phone provider um, or an affordable option for your network provider. I believe that consumers didn't feel like they had power in this situation, even if they understood the privacy implications of the data that they were giving up, the access that they were giving up. Um, so trying to convince Apple that they were uniquely positioned to uh, demonstrate that privacy can be a differentiator. Privacy is something that consumers value um, when they feel like they have an option. Um, that was really, uh, for me, probably the most um, important thing that I've, that I've done in my career is to demonstrate that privacy is something that has value and there are other paths to, um, to be successful as a, as a technology company beyond just collecting data for the sake of it because maybe you'll have an opportunity to use it in the future. Maybe you know machine learning this, AI that, we'll, we'll find a use for it, so just grab what you can, um, which is how things felt uh, at, that, at that point in time. And then once you collect that data, you have to be a good steward of that data. And, that's hard. You've got a valuable asset, you've got a complex environment. No matter how sophisticated you are at security, it's really difficult to be consistent in application, to be consistent in deployment. Um, and so uh, there's always an opportunity for that attacker if they're invested enough, if they're persistent enough. And so reducing the amount of data that you have or reducing your access to it, giving the keys to control it to the user, that was, um, uh, hard justification to make at the time. Mm. Um, but I really feel like that's been something that it, I'm, I'm really happy to see it as an, a direction that the industry is moving in. Yeah, we're all grateful for your pioneering work and your perseverance. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so you mentioned that in early days you worked, uh, you collaborated with the other um, people who you know, shared your passion and it seemed like they were women as well. Um, as you know, uh, the uh, award winner uh, Rama w mentioned uh, that there is a lack of gender diversity in the, the tech industry in general today. Um, uh, and I'm just curious in the actual area of cybersecurity, if there's a similar level of gender di 
uh, lack of gender diversity. And I ask because obviously our keynote speaker is a, a female. Uh, we have a, a multiple faculty in the EECS department here who are working in the area of cybersecurity, and they're all female. So I'm just wondering, um, is, is it is it more like balanced, and, and actually, do women care more about these kinds of issues than men? What what is the diversity like in in the just the area of cybersecurity? So, women are underrepresented, but also women are less visible. So even when there are women, you don't necessarily see them speaking at the conferences. You don't necessarily see them uh, getting the sort of visibility that their male peers their male, peer, male peers get, um, which is potentially. Uh, frustrating for young women who are trying to identify folks to emulate as they consider their different uh, career path options. Um, so being there, there are, there are actually quite a lot of women in security. And uh, yeah. I used to say things like a long time ago, uh, you know, oh, we've met before. Oh, yeah, of course we've met before. Like, it, it, you, you do look familiar. Well, there's only so many of us. And I've stopped saying that because there are actually so many of us. Um, so uh, there was a, a time where it really felt like we all knew each other because so, it, was a, it was a very small place. But, uh, but no, there's sort of, so many women. Is there a community of women in cybersecurity? I know uh, in another era of EECS here, you know, the control systems, like um, they, there's a group called Women in Control. <laughs> Do you have similar kind of a you know, professional network there that, that's developing? For women in cybersecurity, there are a lot of communities for women in security. I, I haven't been hugely active in those kinds of mm. groups, um, mostly because I, I had my network in place, not just women, but like you know across the security industry, which I'm very privileged to have and very uh, fortunate to have those kinds of networks. So it, it it never occurred to me to go join these kinds of groups and 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 see if there was uh, something uh, that I. Uh, was missing that I could find in these groups hmm. because I, I feel like I do have a pretty significant network in the, in the, the computer security space. But if I didn't, then I would be um, really aching for it because I feel like I, I find such value in being able to connect with folks and share our problems and you know bounce ideas off each other. And for whatever like slice of the security space I am uh, looking to understand, I, I do actually know somebody, or I have some 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 person I can reach out to and say, "Hey, uh, I'm I'm trying to understand this thing. Can you you know, can I buy you a coffee while you while you uh, uh, while I pick your brain?" And because I have a set of folks that I can reach out to like that, and 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 have these kinds of conversations with, I am more successful as a professional because I have access to this. So the value of network is is uh, immeasurable. It's it's hugely important. So for all of these different communities out there, whether they are specific to women, whether they're specific to your uh, specific slice of, of, um, of computer security or, or uh, privacy, as the case may be, I, I cannot uh, overestimate how influential it has um, been to my, my personal success to have access to other folks who uh, have such a diversity of, of experiences and, and, um, and expertise. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe transitioning to a different perspective. Um, today we see a um, proliferation of um, devices that are smart, right? smart devices in the home, like doorbells and um, these uh, Alexa and so on. Um, what kind of uh, security challenges do you see with the proliferation of such devices? And like, uh, for us as consumers, um, what do you think we should be aware of? Do you think privacy and security of data is going to be even more difficult? To, to maintain? I definitely think that the, the amount of data that we're correct, uh, creating and the different ways that it's being used is outpacing our ability to recognize. Um, it's unreasonable to expect that the consumer can identify all the different ways that their data might be used and how it might impact them in the future. Um, uh, to Ms. Song's point about uh, DNA analysis. If I give my analysis, my, my data over to my DNA over to one of these systems for the, the benefit of identifying you know, other folks I might be connected to, and I don't know how that information might be used, it's not just about me in this case. I'm also potentially exposing my children because we share DNA, and maybe even my grandchildren at some point, possibly. I don't know all the, the full scope of, of, of the choice that I'm making when I say, yeah, it's fine for uh, you know, terms of service. Did I read this? Click, click, click. I think the, the, the scale is completely unmanageable for a consumer to get their head around, and even for a practitioner or an expert in the space to be able to anticipate. 
I, I think from a, from a security perspective from a, and from a privacy perspective, we are uh, unable to mitigate our risk. And whether it's because you don't have enough option about which providers, or whether maybe all the providers are, 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 are doing something similar with your data, selling it to who knows where, uh, controlling it or maybe not controlling it very well, that uh, it's, it's unreasonable to expect consumers to be able to, to, to work on this. But even if you're not the, in a position to, um, let's say, make the choice or sign those, you know, accept those terms of service, there is all kind of data that's being collected from us that we are not consenting to. So whether it's because you're walking down the street and all your neighbors ring doorbells and um, security cameras are uploading your face to the cloud and then they're selling data to um, another party that's using this for facial recognition. Maybe they're doing traffic analysis. Maybe they're doing, uh, maybe they're supporting law enforcement. Maybe they're supporting things that you might feel are completely reasonable. You don't necessarily know that it's happening. You might be okay with it, but it, it's not a choice. It's just happening. And uh, it, goes, it goes beyond that. Like for the, the, the set of conversations that you have in your household, you might have put that um, personal assistant device in your house, whether it's an Alexa or a home or whatever it might be. You made a choice. But if you didn't, do you recognize it when you walk into somebody else's home? Do you recognize that they've got a, uh, um, uh, an anti-cam that's uploading uh, your conversation to the cloud? It's, it's, um, it, it goes beyond that. For every social network that you join and asks you to upload your contacts, creates a, uh, a, a network that you don't even have to participate in for them to know a huge amount about you. That uh, you know, if these four people have my name in their address book and I don't join the, uh, the, the network, the network still gets to know that these four people know me and create a profile about me over time. They still know that uh, this face that appears in this set of photographs uploaded by this set of folks who happen to know me but I'm not present in their network, maybe this face is a good candidate for my face, even though I haven't participated. If this network creates a set of beacons that they apply to every single web page that uh, I end up visiting, over time you can, uh, uh, without intending to par participate in these systems, have all sorts of data collected without making a choice necessarily, without even being able to recognize it. So never mind whether the consumer is making a choice about this, never mind whether the practitioner or the expert is sophisticated enough to make the kinds of choices that reflect the, the stewardship of their data that they would choose for themselves. It's completely unreasonable to expect that, there's, that this is within the realm of individual control. All right, that's pretty scary. <laughs> Thank you for increasing our awareness of the, uh, the magnitude of the challenge ahead. Um, so this means that we should be trying to uh, uh, attract more, more talented um, researchers and engineers, computer scientists to, to the field of cybersecurity. And how would you, what advice would you give to people who are considering um, this as a career option? How can they prepare best for it? What's, what's a, a good way to get into it? So this is always a tough question for me, um, because when I look back on the things that I could have chosen at different points in my life to go do, uh, I'm happy to be where I am today, but I might have chosen something else if I had known what the environment was going to be like. Hmm. And so wow. what kept me here was choosing over and over again this thing that I loved. I love technology. I loved this about technology. I loved identifying how things work and then identifying how they break. And because I loved it, it was um, a, a, a reasonable trade-off for me to tolerate environments that were unfriendly. But the thing that keeps me here today is feeling like the things that I do have an impact, that when I participate in an engineering meeting and I'm there to represent and say like, hey, for people who maybe are not like the people in this room, they might think about this feature a little bit differently. And whether it's about you know, the, uh, how this information gets used. Like, hey, do we have a plan to delete this? I don't see that as part of the, uh, the design document. How long are we gonna keep this data? Where are we gonna keep this data? How is it gonna be protected? Who's got access to the keys? Are we gonna ship this off to a third party cloud service for analysis? What's their policy about it? Uh, being in the room and staying present, and feeling like the things that you do make, have an impact in whether that is keeping this data secure uh, or even just having that conversation. So folks think about what does it mean that um, 
that uh, you know, this location is being collected, this location is ma being made accessible. It's, it's really fun to think about the delightful feature that you're enabling. And it's you know, not fun to be the, the downer who's always talking about the way it might be abused. But it feels like it has impact. And for me, that's been the thing that's been, um, uh, let's say, a reason to continue to participate, especially as a secu security practitioner, where you don't necessarily feel like you ever really get to win, <laughs> especially as a defender, right? Like, you only notice security when it fails. Right. So right. it's, um, which is good. Like, you shouldn't see security uh, unless it fails. Um, but feeling like the attacker will always win, and the best you can hope for is to be able to minimize impact, to reduce the scope of what is compromised, to increase your ability to get back to a known good state, to um, be able to communicate effectively about what's going to happen and how we're not going to have this specific thing happen again in the future and how we're making our systems more resilient based on what we've understood from this specific kind of problem. That is actually success. And um, if you can't, if you don't get to have you know, the moment of like, you know, yay, we did the thing, then what are the things that keep you engaged? What are the things that make you feel like the work that you're doing is valuable and that you're making a contribution and that what you, that what you do matters? So yeah, I think having that conversation in the room and being the one to say, yeah, but for somebody who maybe doesn't want to be found by all their friends, maybe they've got uh, an abuser that they're trying to keep out of their network. Maybe they are, um, maybe this aspect of their identity is something that might be compromising in some situations. Maybe there is something that, um, in some other jurisdiction, in some other environment that's not like ours, might be compromising for this person. Is this something that we really want to um, uh, uh, expose? That, those are the things that, that uh, make me happy to, uh, to, to participate and be in this environment. And if, if you can find that, that thing that inspires you, that makes you feel like the way you're spending your time is worthwhile, then it's, uh, it's, it's worth the, uh, the difficulty. This, like, this space never ends, too. You also have to like, just uh, consume a huge amount of information to stay up to date. There's like this constant, um, maybe for some folks it feels like a treadmill. For me, it feels you know, exciting to be able to participate and, 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 and learn about these things. You know, differential privacy, and I'm excited to go talk about homomorphic encryption later. This is, these are the things that like, you know, like I'm excited, uh, but it's also very, it's hard. It's hard to stay up to date, and it's hard to, to um, uh, uh, make sure that you understand the changing landscape, the different threats, what's happening in a different region, what's happening with a different market. Um, but if you love it, if you find that, that, that aspect of the space that's uh, uh, compelling to you, then it can be an incredible place. So the intellectual vibrancy and the significant impact, even if it's not visible, um, are, are what caused you to persist. It's, it's what keeps me yep. uh, signing up for it. Would you like to share some of the challenges you, you alluded to, maybe climate, um, like, and how, how did you overcome this other than having uh, mentors, coaches, um, and just this drive, to, uh, this passion, uh, this inspiration inside you? Are there other, other things that, you know, other tips for you know, aspiring you know, uh, cybersecurity leaders that um, they can learn from your your career? No. No. <laughs> okay. That's it. So, resilience. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, why don't we open it up now to questions from the audience? Yeah, thank you. I'm going to be the moderator sort of for the questions. Um, so, if you have questions, please post them to the HOVA app. And if you haven't had a chance to download that, we do also have some note cards and pencils. If you want to raise your hand, we can pass those around as well. Um, but we're going to handle it that way. So one of the questions that came in um, was about thinking about, and you alluded to it a little bit in one of your previous responses, how do you um, get over the stigma or the um, sort of perspective that the security people are the ones that are just stopping development? You know, how can you better tell the success stories that I know that you have um, but what, what is that role for you in the companies that you've worked in? I love this question. I, I have seen a lot of organizations where security is kind of set up to be the no machine. And it's really easy to say no. It's very easy to reduce your risk if your answer is always no. But um, <laughs> it's not very helpful to the business. So I try to build security organizations that are partners with the engineering organizations, are partnered with the business, because I perceive security to be an enablement. 
um, and finding ways to do the thing, the delightful, beautiful, uh, exciting thing that the product team wants to do uh, in a way that is less risky to the organization, that is much more useful than just being the person who says, no, don't do this thing. And it, it's absolutely uh, uh, the case that um, it's very easy to be you know, the downer all the time. But uh, for some uh, environments, security and privacy can actually be the differentiator. If you find, for example, a way to secure a transaction um, that enables you to do it in a way that wasn't previously able to be done before, you might open up a whole new opportunity for, um, for, 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 for payments ecosystem or for, um, for the economy. If you find uh, a way to give control over uh, the information on their devices to the user, you might actually make privacy a differentiator for your product. There are ways to be an enablement to the business that um, uh, allow the security organization or the privacy engineering organization to be a, uh, a, a critical part, party to the success of the product um, and maybe expand into uh, those delightful features that, that your users or your customers will, will love. Thank you, Abby. Thank That's you. a great answer. Um, thinking about some of the new emerging technologies such as 5G, um, do you see other, um, uh, um, thank you, uh, risks or hazards with those or are there particular um, strategies that we should be thinking about uh, with respect to cybersecurity and, and new technology? Every technology, every new um, advance introduces new attack surface, new threats. It's, um, it's not specific to, to any specific technology, it's just to complexity. Every time you add complexity, you create new ways for, for things to fail, and some of those ways will result in security uh, challenges or opportunities. So one of the things that we can do is, as we um, introduce complexity in one area, to go back and revisit some of the things that we've implemented previously. Is that still supporting a business need? Is that still uh, in use? And reducing the uh, attack surface by eliminating those features and, and, and sunsetting those features that are no longer being used. Because instead of trying to find the vulnerabilities in those mechanisms and feeling like maybe we've created a, a component that's resilient, if you just get rid of it altogether, then you can say for sure that you're not going to be impacted by the vulnerabilities in that code, in that feature, in that, in that system. Um, and as we create more and more advanced, more and more complex systems, we also need to be doing cleanup and, and saying that this is not that important and it's not worth the risk, that we don't have the bandwidth to uh, apply the same level of security rigor to everything that we're doing, especially as we continue to learn new things. We'd have to go back and look at that code again and say, hey, based on what we know today, based on our new sets of tools and uh, techniques, how, what, what can we identify in, in this component to secure? That's, it doesn't scale. So going back and, and creating this as part of your, 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 your development processes is this still in use? Does this still serve our business needs? And if not, can we get rid of it? Can we reduce our data? Do we still need this data? Is this, um, can, we, can we just take our inferences and, and get rid of the data altogether? Can we um, reduce the granularity of this data? Is it really important to know that on Tuesday at 3.42 um, and 21 seconds, this person was located at this very specific coordinate? Or is it sufficient for us to say um, at this point in time that on Tuesdays, in general, people traveling from this location to that location spend 42 minutes? Right, like the, there's there's a there's a point to which it's useful to your business purposes, and a point where it's not. So reducing the the, the granularity of the data, reducing the amount of data, reducing the specificity of this, that data, especially if it's beyond the um, the if it's served a, a purpose that's no longer um, as uh, a, as uh, relevant. Being conscious of those sorts of things, creating those mechanism me mechanisms, revisiting the things that you've built in the past to identify ways to. Uh, clean up the old while you're building the new. What you're talking about speaks to some of the questions that are coming in around um, an ethical approach to data and data security, data um, protection. So how much data do you actually need to collect? How much do you need to hold on to? Are there inferences, for instance, uh, that would serve a similar purpose to the actual data that would be more data um, privacy preserving? Uh, are there other pieces of advice that you would give either to companies or questions that you might suggest that students here who are applying for jobs might ask about a company's um, data policies with respect to ethics? So yeah, I'd ask them, uh, do you correct, collect data for a specific business purpose? Not necessarily why you're interviewing, but why you're an engineer in that space. <laughs> <laughs> This is where we are today, right? But being that, being that engineer who's in the room saying like, 
but how will the data be deleted, right? Like, just ask the question. Nobody thought about it. <laughs> like, not today. Like, that's just not like the, the, the general practice. But we collected over here, but when, when is it deleted? Deleted. How will we know um, uh, what sort of consent was associated with this data so that you know, we understand which purposes it can be used for in the future? Because it's incredibly valuable, and people will try and find ways to use it over and over again in different ways. So if we don't have any way of, of, um, uh, of tracking that through our system, then maybe it will be used for ways that we, uh, we, we might not have um, uh, collected consent for. Are there, uh, how long are we going to keep it? What system is going to delete it? Ask those questions. But it's uh, it's not it's not just about data. It's also the you know the function. Is this is this going to be um, a potential for abuse in in circumstances that uh, uh, go beyond the way we intend for the feature to be used? This is one of the, the the core elements of security here. That like yeah, the way you intend it to be used is fantastic. But that's not what people are going to do. People are going to end up once it's out there in the world. People are going to use it in all kinds of ways. Like you might think that you you built a let's say a file sharing system, and um, then, like 20 years later, it's turned into this like behemoth that you know, like fantastic. Your your open source project ends up being you know deployed everywhere. But now it's deployed in everything from like you know a consumer device that is protecting uh, you know your your schoolwork from your pesky little brother, or it might be deployed in the highest security environments, protecting you know nation state secrets. It's 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 uh, it's hard to predict all the different places where your where your uh, systems may end up. So considering, let's say, what happens if this is um, applied in a, in a different uh, uh, scope, is this, uh, is this protocol um, uh, more, more complex than it needs to be? How do these systems fail? Um, and when it fails, does it fail gracefully in a way that like, you know, can be captured? All these different questions are also just about resilience in general, not just about security. Um, and since we consider ourselves better software engineers for thinking about how to build systems that are reliable. Um, we should, all of us, not just in this room here, all of us as software engineers, all of us as uh, builders of technology, uh, need to consider how our systems are resilient, resilient and um, the way that things fail include people attempting to make them fail. Thank you. Have you seen good strategies uh, within the companies that you've worked for, or those that you're aware of, for um, increasing the number of women, particularly in technical positions? Often we see this trend of women perhaps coming into a company as a, in a technical role and then moving into more of a managerial role. Um, do you have thoughts about, about that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Oh, well, uh, Suji perhaps could elaborate too. I mean, we've talked about this a lot oh, in the women's yeah, tech. I guess uh, even as we're making progress in d diversifying the, the talent pool in to, that gets trained through uh, universities, uh, we find that you know, women who get hired into technical positions, there have been studies, within 10 years or 12 years, more than half of them have left the technical track because um, for various reasons, including not seeing a, a clear path to advancement in, in management and to the C-suite and so on. And I guess the question is, how do you see that, what, what can we do to sort of um, get rid of these barriers for women to advance in, in technical tracks? I feel a bit of a conflict here because while I would love to see more uh, women as you know, the principal engineers and the, the, uh, the staff uh, engineers at these big companies and these, uh, 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 <coughs> in these incredibly technical roles. I also want to see more women in the boardroom so that they go to mm -hmm. <laughs> technical tracks, that they, they leave the technical track and go to managerial. I don't know, I feel like I've got, I've got both of these objectives um, in mind. And if they take this technical information to the boardroom, that's also serving the, uh, the needs for, for, um, for these businesses. I, I want to have software engineers in the, bo in the boardroom and, and actually enge technology engineers of, of, uh, of all, I don't mean to leave your hardware enge engineers out of it. It's just I, I have my, my, my little bias here. So, yeah, <laughs> technology engineers, I want them to, to be represented uh, in the, uh, at the boardroom at the highest levels of, of, of corporate management. If they're going to management because they feel like there's no opportunity from the, for them on the, on the technical side of things, that's, of course, unacceptable. We want them to be able to see that there are opportunities for them. But it's, uh, if, they're, if their interests have changed, if they've decided that there's uh, a contribution that they can make on a different scale, because they're in the management space, then you know I really want to encourage that as well. You know, absolutely. I think the the challenge seems to be that there are 
fewer women, there's greater attrition going up in management levels, including technical management, but maybe <coughs> women tend to go into like HR or sales and marketing um, rather than sort of becoming technical managers. Oh, from the start. Yeah. I mean, it seems like, and the data shows that. And it's worse for women of color. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is not my area of expertise. <laughs> I can tell you how to but, secure your systems, but like, you know. In, increasing the visibility of uh, women like you who've succeeded, uh, I think should yeah. be one of the um, solutions, yeah, uh, part of the solution, for sure. Absolutely. Um, so maybe just one or two more questions. One is, um, many companies are transferring their data to cloud uh, providers, and are there particular differences for data security regarding cloud computing? Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, as you as you consider the the, uh, the threat boundary for your uh, your system, the there's potentially a set of uh, systems that you control, and maybe you control them all the way down to. Um, the, uh, the hardware. Maybe they're actually deployed in a data center that you guys control on an operating system that's being managed by your 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 your, your infrastructure, and the networking is is managed by your uh, by your infrastructure team. Um, and you, you put your application on top of that, and you do some sort of uh, transformation on your data. And uh, at some point, you ship it off to the cloud, and that passes a trust boundary, and it's going off to. Um, let's say it's a, a service, not just another hosted instance of, of, of an operating system that you control, but now hosted in the cloud and someone else is, is, ma someone else is managing, um, let's say, uh, a hypervisor underneath it and then and the hardware on somebody else's network. Okay, that's a, a certain level of uh, risk, but um, a lot of those, those companies are better equipped to manage the security of that uh, system than perhaps your environment is, is able to, uh, but some of them are not. Um, so making those kinds of those kinds of evaluations is really difficult. So if you're sending your data off to a cloud provider, uh, and it's it's not on an operating system that you control, it's on a uh, a service that that they're managing, and you're putting your data into the service. So you you've you've let it out of your network, and it's being processed on a service that uh, you don't manage. It's possibly running in the same process space with um, another tenant on the service. So a vulnerability in that service might give access to your data, not just to, um, let's say, somebody who has access to that system, but maybe somebody who has access to the service that's on the same uh, uh, instance of the uh, operating system and possibly same process as the service. So these are kinds of questions that I, I like to ask, like how is this actually uh, hosted? And things I, that I like to think about because that's actually a lot of exposure. Because even if it's encrypted at rest, it's got to be decrypted in order for the service to be able to do something with it, right? So now we're talking about your exposed, unencrypted data that is, um, let's say, in an environment that's semi-porous, available to uh, uh, any other tenant that happens to be running in the same uh, system. So it gets, it gets to be kind of scary kind of quickly. So things I like to consider are what is the, the impact of exposure of this data? What is the, what are you know, what sort of uh, mechanisms do we have in place for compartmentalization and isolation? If it's, for example, running in a, a, a different process, well, that's a boundary. If it's running in a different instance, that's an even more, uh, that's high, more, more highly compartmentalized. That's that's something. Um, I don't. I, I I do incredibly I do value these services a lot. I think that they're uh, in, allowing for a huge amount of. Um, uh, uh, capability that a lot of these other environments couldn't build for themselves, and they probably even couldn't manage it for themselves, even if they could like you know, take this technology, deploy it in their own environment, and then manage it as a, a local service. But it's not appropriate for every application. So trying to figure out if it's appropriate for your application is, is part of the work that we have to do, because we are all becoming so interdependent on uh, on these cloud services that uh, in ways that we don't necessarily expect. Uh, a few years back, there was a uh, an outage in this DNS service called Dyn, which took down so many things around the internet. And whether you, whether or not you were a customer of Dyn or not was not a factor in whether or not you were going to be the one impacted, because all the providers that you rely on were also impacted. So um, in addition to taking out Dyn and all the services that rely on Dyn, it might take out uh, you at your environment. And then Slack was one of the services that were impacted. And if you're relying on Slack to try and coordinate response to the internet system, you might actually be impacted in your ability to respond to what's happening in the environment just because your, one of your critical services that you may or may not recognize as a critical service might be unavailable. So it's, uh, it's another aspect to consider is how interdependent you are it's, you get past a certain point where you can't recognize all the different dependencies you might have in any of these environments. 
I don't have a great answer for this. It's like it's actually incredibly difficult, and it's one of the things that, that I struggle with, especially in environments that have high availability requirements. That yeah, we are growing more and more interdependent, and there are lots of ways that we might not expect for uh, any um, uh, smaller provider to actually have a huge impact across all kinds of services that you may or may not expect. Thank you. Well, raising all those extra questions is also helpful for all of us to think through <laughs> the implications yeah. and what seems to be a simple question at the outset. So well, maybe for our last question, I'll ask just um, one about the pipeline and what words of encouragement you might have for um, <laughs> girls in middle school, high school, uh, or even undergraduate students here to think about a career in cybersecurity. Find that thing that you feel really enthusiastic about. Find that thing that you find compelling that you want to work on. If you find yourself doing the work and it doesn't feel like work, that's a good sign. If you find yourself up at 2 a.m. reading articles, not because they were assigned, but because you're interested in it, that's a good sign. Um, if you feel like find yourself writing code and showing it to your friends and getting excited about it and like working on stuff and this is not part of the assignment and nobody's paying you for this and you put it out there and you get re responses back and wow, those people were mean, like, but you still continue. <laughs> Those are good signs. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you find yourself excited on that level, then this might be a great space for you. If you're doing it because it's well compensated, you might find that like, that trade-off may or may not be worth it over time. If you find that um, there's so much opportunity, this is the direction of the future, and that's you know, why, you're, why you're on this path, um, those things are still true, but it might not be enough to sustain you. So yeah, I, I would just try and pay attention to the things that get you excited. Um, and if this happens to be one of them, then, you know, fantastic. I, I fully encourage you to throw everything at it. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, you, thank you so much, Window, for sharing your perspectives and your passion with us. And uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing, actually, to help ensure the safe and secure, um, yeah, cybersecurity for all. And I think we have a small token of our appreciation here for you. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Oh, for me too? Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. Thank you, thank you so much. All right.